we, we talked about a number, about a date. And it seemed, you know, Rick, when you've spoken, it's almost about, it's, it's a lot about funds. And it's almost dollars per uh, subject and things like that. And I'm wondering, um, uh, you know, as the rescheduling process continues, um, uh, will the attitudes of um, society be changed by that rescheduling as it has to be changed before, in order for that rescheduling to take place? So, you know, what is the... Um, I'm asking you to speculate on what the impact of reintroducing psychedelics into, into Western society would be. I know that's a very big, big question, but what, 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 are we, what can we look forward to in terms of major change in our society? Well, I, I think it's true that all the things that we think are going to fundamentally transform things, I think you said it, Bob, too, it's like the job is never really done. There's always this uh, growth that still needs to happen. So I think once we've... Just the way we, many people thought just having women get the vote, that that would change everything, and we still get a lot of bad people, <laughs> difficult people elected. So I, I think that with psychedelics, if they were to be um, integrated in our society, that there would be a lot more healing taking place, a lot more spirituality, uh, a shift from more fundamentalistic approaches to more direct spirituality. I don't think it would... Um, it would reinvigorate religion rather than uh, extinguish religion. I think people would just find the forms uh, that they would be able to invest them in uh, with more genuine energy. Um, I think that there would be a lot less uh, scapegoating. I, I could say, I guess for me, that integrating psychedelics in my life personally uh, has brought me in touch with my feelings. I was very thoughtful, and so I think it's been grounding and uh, opening for me. I think I've had... Um, challenging experiences like um, getting ready to be a parent. Um, I think it was more for my benefit than my wife's, but we did MDMA together as we were planning to have our first child. And that's kind of a scary thing. You know, all of a sudden, somebody else is in charge of your life and, you know, and you have responsibilities. And so that was a really scary thing. And so I, I know how, you know, you're about to swim into a, go into a pool or something, and it's cold water, and you can hesitate for half an hour before you go in, and you're only going to be cold for 10 seconds or something like that. So I think there'll be more um, willingness to take on those initial little, little challenges. And I think it would be, um, I, I mean, I think it'd be fundamental. I think it's worth all of our energies and all of our lives to try to do this. Um, and I think that um, it won't solve all the problems, but I think it will make it a much, much better world. Um, as far as the timetable, you know, Neil asked about that. We, we've had a $5 million five-year plan for about 15 years. Um, and then we have a $10 million 10-year plan for about the last 10 years. <laughs> so I think one of the most embarrassing things for me is to look over the MAPS bulletin because we try to um, keep them all up on the website. And I look at my predictions as far as when things were going to happen. And uh, I think the only thing that I'm incorrect about is that I've been wrong all the time. <laughs> But I think it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think the question is, is it a worthwhile project to invest um, uh, our lives and time in? And I think it is. And I think the timing, the money, the how long it happens, um, it's satisfying the struggle itself. And I think that's the only way that I've been able to continue it for this you know, long period of time is that the struggle itself is nourishing. And the outcomes are dependent upon things that are beyond any one of our control. And so if we were to be focused on outcomes as something that we need in order to strengthen us to continue, um, we'd probably been discouraged long ago. So I've been able to just refocus. Uh, and as far as, um, you know, I, I think that there'll still be lots of people that don't use psychedelics. I think once we get psychedelics integrated into culture, it's not a path for everybody. There's a lot of people that maybe are more skillful at having these experiences without it. Um, you know, I think breathwork, the holotropic breathwork that Stan and Christina have developed, I have a lot of respect. It's harder to do breathwork than it is, I think, to take psychedelics because you have to sort of voluntarily uh, move your own defenses to a place where things can come up, and you have to then, through your breath, keep going. And a lot of times when you hit these difficult spots, it's hard to um, keep breathing through it. And with psychedelics, you take it, you're sort of on the journey, and you just have this flow of material. So it's, 
a lot of these options I think people will choose. It's just that we have an attitude towards acceptance of the full range of consciousness. There'll be some people gravitate that way, some people not. I think it's more difficult taking psychedelics and not taking them. I think you need more discipline to take them than just have a drink. But I don't think it's a cure-all um, at all. But I think it's rather like the shaman going on his journey. Maybe you get a little bit of valuable information to bring back to the land lovers back home. So I think it's worth it for society to have people who are prepared to take the risk, if you like. Do you want me to say something? <laughs> I, I would just add, not necessarily with respect to integrating them into the culture as a whole, but um, there are people that are suffering that could use these treatments. I mean, we started to ha with Hefter. Our main focus has been the distress and depression of people that are dying. But if you can alleviate that in people that are dying, then can't you back out and go to people that aren't dying and do the same thing? And the young kid that's already by 12 and got a, got a, a list of offenses at the police department who comes out of a very dysfunctional family and maybe has been abused as a child, and that person's life is going in the wrong direction. And this is way out there, but could you take a person, an adolescent, and do a therapy with some kind of psychedelic and move them back into a positive direction? Our society isn't prepared to do things like that. These kinds of people are either not treated well or just kind of written off, and they never have the quality of life they should have. So I see the psychedelics integrated in some kind of a medical, psychiatric context to just overall improve the quality of life for people who didn't have the advantages that most of us have had and to bring their lives into a direction where they can enjoy the fullness of creation, being alive without being burdened by depression and anxiety and, and different types of emotional disorders. So that's what I would see initially really as a, a really the benefit before we get to some of the more esoteric things of cultural integration. A little to add to that. So we talk about psychedelics, we're really talking about <clears throat> many modalities of action and outcome. In Jim Fadiman's recent book, he's categorized them uh, in terms of psychotherapy being one category. Creativity is another category, whether that's artistic or engineering, scientific, but you know, in the domain of thought. And the third being an opportunity to touch non-duality, meaning transcendence of ego or ego dissolution, which typically happens only with very high doses. So the outcomes personally and culturally of each of those three modalities of use are gonna be pretty different. It's almost like we could have three different conferences. One's about creativity, and one's about psychotherapy, and one is about the downstream consequences of a population in which more people, as adults, have had non-duality. It's three very different tracks. What Dave was talking about, the alleviation of suffering, can come from at least two of those. One is the psychotherapeutic healing of wounds, basically. And the other strikes me as much more systemic, much deeper. And that's, uh, I don't want to use the word cure. Let's just say from a non-dual perspective, those sets of concerns or sources of suffering get diminished. Um, what are the prospects for this work? I feel as though it's kind of hard to go very badly wrong. Right, there's enough safeguards in place, enough checks and balances now, enough people who are well informed that there isn't going to be some big disaster. Um, maybe had the 60s gone a little bit differently when the substances weren't as known or the political forces were operating differently, maybe it could have gone worse. But I don't think it's going to happen. So what might then be the time course, and if not the time course, then at least the, the stages along the way of what I would view, we probably all view as a dramatic improvement in the culture. I keep coming back to, it's worth doing this because we're not gonna make big mistakes. There's going to be suffering at the individual level that will get alleviated more and more along the way. But the real prize, A, it never comes. B, the biggest ones might not happen in any of our lifetimes. It's really young. Um, 
here's what has to happen. Here's why I keep coming back to this long arc over generations. This has not changed five years over five years or ten years over ten years. The little ticks on the ruler are probably best thought of as decades or generations, human generations. Let me illustrate this way. One consequence of non-duality, if, if you have this convincing experience, you have an experience and you are convinced by it that all is one, that there's one unified field of consciousness, and here we are with our illusions of separation, that's an illusion. The real reality is all one. If you've had that experience and if it is convincing, it immediately means there's, a, there's opportunity for compassion for everyone because compassion for you is the same as compassion for me. It's the point philosophically where selfishness and altruism merge. They're not different anymore. So if enough of the culture is at that point where altruism and selfishness are the same thing, wouldn't that immediately result in utopia? And my answer is no. The will alone for the rest of the seven billion people, or however many, the will alone for all seven billion people to be happy and free of optional suffering isn't enough. The problems are deeply technical. I will illustrate with a very simple example of how they get technical. A whole bunch of years ago, who reads Consumer Reports here, knows the magazine, you know, independent testing, whatever? This showed up a long time ago. Uh, around diapers, I think it must have been at a time when disposable diapers were a new phenomenon, and there are companies selling disposable diapers. Oh, it's convenient. Don't have to deal with soiled diapers. You get a fresh one every time. It's more sanitary. And they sold for a little while until somebody said, wait a minute, what are the ecological consequences of using these disposable diapers? And then the washable diaper industry speaks up for, oh, we reuse the cloth and, and the, more sustainable. It gets really technically complicated because they have to be washed. They have to be trucked to the house and then back to the place where they get washed. Somebody who actually wants to do the right thing, it's hard to know what the right thing to do is. You could be super duper non-dual. I want to be good to the environment. I want to be good to my kid. Tell, just tell me which one of these. And the experts disagree whether the reusable diapers or the disposable diapers are the better course. Translate that trivial example to transportation, to energy, to political governance, to education. And we see it's really kind of a, it's a big tangled, don't want to say the word mess, but that's the word that comes to mind, that the best intentions alone don't solve unless you give it enough generations. So lots of generations. Thank you. So we have some uh, people who have a question. Uh, please just state your name if you want to. And uh, if you have someone it's directed to, let us know. Great. Uh, can, is this on? Yes. Great. Is the my mic name, on? My yes. name is Matt. And uh, Rick, you alluded to this a little bit this morning, but I'm curious. Um, how we, I think we, we can acknowledge and know like helping people get over traumas and different things we would maybe put in a category of maybe pathologies that, um, you know, different tools can be helpful for that. How do we maintain the conversation at the same time that people who are healthy, who maybe have jobs and children, but maybe once or twice a year like to um, also engage in these tools for personal growth and development, um, exploration. How do we keep that conversation in balance so that it all doesn't become about healing pathologies, but also helping people who are, you know, working with people who are kind of healthy? Yeah. So if anybody could speak to it, but I know you kind of alluded to it this morning. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think that from a practical, political, strategic point of view, that focusing on making uh, psychedelics into medicines for treatment of particular illnesses is the best, uh, most effective way to channel our limited resources in terms of changing public attitudes. The media reports on scientific development so we can amplify the message through earned media and we can counter the hundreds of millions of dollars of anti-drug education that is miseducation. So I think that the medicalization, we've had a, an issue about uh, MDMA, for example, for couples therapy, where it's tremendous. One of the best uses of MDMA is for couples to be able to listen better, to communicate more honestly, and to deal with um, you know patterns that maybe have built up over years or decades. But having a difficult relationship or even improving your relationship is not—it's not a disease. It's not something that fits shoehorns into the 
FDA model. So that's why we're not looking into it. But that's one of the most important areas of research I think that's not being done would be uh, relationships and MDMA for relationships. So I think that the first thing is to say that my, the end goal is not a medical priesthood that's in charge of all psychedelics. That that's a limited set of goals and that will educate people. But then the other track, the betterment of well people, there's either religious freedom or drug legalization. And I think religious freedom is really not um, for individuals to have spiritual experience. It's just within groups. And I think there's a lot of value in the, um, the Native American church with peyote and the UDV and the Santo Daime. But I think that in general, religious freedom requires you to buy into religion. And so I think that can expand. But full religious freedom is, again, like legalization. Uh, for this individual choice. So I think that it's important to have a focus on policy change and a focus on science. And if you can keep both of those going at the same time, then the problem is that if you just focus strictly on the medical aspect, you are going to encounter less resistance. So when you start talking about um, broader applications to people that don't have a, a specifically defined illness, um, you get into big issues of um, drug policy. And, and I think ultimately it's really important to do so. So I've tried to do that, but I think that's been uh, complicated. And I would say that one of the um, strategic uh, advantages that uh, Dave sort of talked about of having Hefter just focus on the more of the science and the medicine and not so much on the policy that that's, uh, maybe they'll make it first across the finish line because they don't have the baggage that we're bringing with uh, fighting the drug war. But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of people, donors, who want to um, make this larger change and see the medicine as part of that larger change. So I I've chosen to um, sort of talk about both and have a foot in both worlds. And, and one of the things that, Bob, you mentioned, the, the different ways, but the, the other thing you that is the celebratory use of psychedelics. And we see that enormously in um, festivals that are happening all over the world where young people are getting together for often a week at a time or a weekend at a time and then there's heavy use of psychedelics in those contexts. And so that I think could be one of the mechanisms for a potential backlash because these are people that are you know, using psychedelics, they're not so sure if they're pure, they're using them in riskier situations, they're mixing all the drugs together, and so we've chosen to have a whole project on psychedelic harm reduction, where we're trying to work at festivals to have teams of volunteers that are therapists and that are sometimes psychiatrists, sometimes even therapists from our psychedelic research projects, that will work at festivals so that when people have a difficult psychedelic experience, they have a place where they could go. And they could work through it sometimes within a few hours or stay overnight. And so that's also been a question. Does our work at festivals trying to do psychedelic harm reduction complicate our work when we want to talk to government regulators who think all of this stuff should be totally you know, criminalized? And I think what has been um, the, the really key to our development is that there are people at FDA who are interested in science over politics when it comes to psychedelics and medical marijuana research. The FDA has opened the door to marijuana research. We just can't get the marijuana. So I, I have felt that being honest about the full range of changes that I'm, I think is necessary to get to the betterment of well people um, as well as to, to heal, it's been worth the extra friction that we may get on our medical research. But I think there's no way to really do to respond to your question without engaging drug policy. And I've, I think that that's a, a worthwhile endeavor, but complicated. About celebration, I'd like to point out that the word celebration is a deeply religious word. I love engaging in the conversation about what religion is or could be and what religion is not necessarily. I have come to a deeply held belief that religion rightly understood presents many opportunities where legal is really the smallest of them. Uh, that's a conversation I would love to have with anyone who would like to have it, including tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Much good 
could come from re-envisioning and re-understanding that word. Um, it will take a great deal of open-mindedness to do that. And I'll say that I didn't use the word recreational drug use, which I could have, but celebratory is uh, more palatable than recreation. But I think we also need to look at recreation, that recreational drug use is often very healing. I mean, we've sort of uh, demonized that concept in our culture, and it's got all these uh, reckless, hedonistic, uh, dangerous connotations. But I think, you know, recreation and celebration, that, uh, that may be even some of the highest uses for group bonding and for ecstatic experiences. I'll drink to that. <laughs> uh, people have asked me at various times, well, maybe the doctors aren't the only ones that should have these drugs. They should be available for everybody for personal, spiritual growth, et cetera. And I'll say, you know, that's probably true, but we live in a very authoritarian, oppressive society. We have freedom of speech, et cetera, but we all know there are ways in which the society is very conservative, very authoritarian, and very oppressive, specifically with respect to the use of these drugs. And my opinion has been, once you demonstrate that these drugs are medically effective, and with the re you see a lot of re-education going on now. How many people have seen documentaries and stories about using psilocybin and mushrooms to heal people, et cetera? I think it becomes much more difficult to imprison people for using something that's recognized to be an effective drug. So from my perspective, really focusing on the medical value, it has the spin-off of re-educating society and saying, well, these are not dangerous. They're really not that dangerous. They're used to treat people, to heal people. So then when people use them recreationally, maybe we'll get to a point where police will say, well, you know, that law is on the books, but we're not going to enforce it. These people are using something that's not, it's known not to be dangerous. So I think one of the spin-offs of the purely medical approach by confining our, at least after by confining ourselves to that approach is that people in general recognize that these are safer to use, and then it becomes much more difficult to enforce draconian laws against people who may use them for personal growth, uh, celebration, or whatever. Yes, I, I completely agree with what Dave says, but at the same time, the fact is that large numbers of people do use drugs for recreational and um, self-development purposes, and they're getting unfairly um, punished. And therefore, I feel a sense of duty that one has to do what one can to improve reform policy so that person, completely innocent people, other than using an illegal substance, aren't going to prison for long um, periods of their life. So I feel that it, there are two prongs which complement each other rather than conflict because I think the scientific evidence of the value of these things feeds in to the policy in time. But I personally don't feel like leaving the policy because I think people are suffering too much from this mistaken policy. And it's particularly um, discriminatory. So on the whole, it's not the richer whites who are suffering. It's the uh, underclass who are suffering, both in terms of geographic, it's the... Uh, producers and transit countries who are taking the weight of the burden of the war on drugs. And it's the um, um, colored people who are taking the weight of the burden in America or in England. And therefore I think one has to f tackle the policy front as well as the science front. Before we go to the next question, I just want to thank the panelists for discussing a controversial issue with such openness and, and, op and, and good heartedness as well. It's just thank you. Um, the next person in the line. My name is, my name is David Mathis. Um, I'm a hospice physician, and uh, we're talking about policy and uh, what's accepted. One of the things that's accepted in uh, uh, hospice is that People are dying, so if I give them a couple of thousand milligrams of morphine a day, it's perfectly acceptable. It's about keeping them comfortable and uh, happy um, and pulling all these things together at the end of their lives. I'd like to, I, I think that it may be a toehold in the United States as far as medicine is concerned uh, to be able to use psychedelics in a hospice situation where we already have the, the green light 
from uh, uh, hospice and palliative care physicians. And I'd like to know uh, where and who is doing this. Now, I work in a prison, so we can't experiment it on inmates, but uh, um, you know, I think that we can get some good uh, information for the New England Journal out of that if uh, uh, Chapel Hill wants to join in. Um, I can tell you that the Hefter Institute has had some fairly high-level connections with the hospice movement in Madison, Wisconsin. They're very interested. We've had an ongoing dialogue with getting uh, psilocybin into the hospice movement there. It's a large hospice group. Uh, the details aren't worked out, but we're quite aware that this is obviously some place that these would be very useful, and there is interest among the hospice groups about that. Actually, um, in the hospices in the Boston area, I was really surprised to learn that they use ketamine. And they use ketamine uh, orally um, in lower doses several times a day as a pain medication. And what they've found is when you combine ketamine with the uh, opiates, that people have better pain relief and you can lower the dose of opiates. And it's only a short step from using low-dose ketamine to using higher-dose ketamine for um, personal growth. Uh, ketamine is the only psychedelic currently that is a legal prescription medicine as a drug for anesthesia, and you can prescribe it off-label. And there is now you know, incredible information about ketamine and depression, and ketamine in pain, and people are opening ketamine clinics right now. It's already starting to happen. But I think to see that it's already been quietly adopted in the whole Boston area with hospice movement to use ketamine, um, I think it's also true with MDMA. MDMA and morphine and, and opiates blend together. They're synergistic, and you can have better pain control, and the opiates make people really sleepy. And if you're under a lot of opiates for pain near the end of your life, it's like you're not even really there anyway. And so when you give MDMA, it kind of wakes people up, and it opens their heart. And I've seen people days from dying who've been basically uh, narcotic, uh, narcotized or sleepy, you know, not even there for weeks, and then are able to sort of open up uh, several days before they die to have sort of saying goodbye to their family. So I think the hospice setting, I think the only way we'll really get anything other than ketamine into the hospice setting will be in a research context, at least initially. But I think as we um, talk about um, a good death and what is a good death, uh, you know, we have Aldous Huxley who took LSD while he was dying. Um, I think that the hospice movement is just a natural place for the use of psychedelics. And, and then there's the question of cannabis, which one knows that um, people who are on opiate painkillers, if they combine it with cannabis, they can use much less opiates. And um, in fact, they can almost stop using their opiates if they control their own cannabis. So I think that should be allowed to be um, introduced to um, pain control. And one's depriving suffering people by not permitting it to be introduced. Another question? My name, my name is Tatiana Ginsburg. I'm from Russia. I'm transpersonal psychologist and MAPS representative. And my question to Rick. Uh, today in your talk, you mentioned that you had been really touched by Holocaust. And if thinking about LSD uh, discovery, it actually happened in the middle of Europe and in 1943, which is almost middle of World War II. So what do you mean? Is there a special meaning of the space and time when LSD has been created? If, if yes, which one? Well, you know, I don't know that there's um, some divine plan that kind of introduced um, LSD at these darkest days. I think the connection um, is more about the next Holocaust in terms of, uh, you know, nuclear annihilation, that around the time of the splitting of the atom, um, psychedelic LSD came to the awareness of people. And um, Nick Sand, who is... Um, one of the um, underground LSD manufacturers who made a um, estimate, he, he developed Orange Sunshine. He, he made around a quarter of a billion doses of LSD. 
um, yeah, his, um, his father worked on the Manhattan Project. So I think this connection between the technological powers of destruction and the psychedelic powers of spiritual evolution are somehow coincident. And whether there's some grand plan, I don't know, but I think it's our opportunity to try to take advantage of the opportunities that psychedelics present to avoid you know, the more massive Holocaust that would affect all of us. And I, I think that Albert sometimes wondered about uh, and felt that there was, he, he talked about there was some peculiar presentiment that led him to resynthesize LSD after it had already been given to uh, animals and had been shown not to be very interesting from the animal models. So what is this peculiar presentiment? Maybe intuition or, or yeah. So I, I don't think we need to uh, uh, leap to you know, divine intervention or anything. But, but I do think that there is a role in getting, uh, using psychedelics to help us understand this non-duality, help us appreciate others that um, really can help forestall the Holocaust, a bigger Holocaust than we've ever had. Another question. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Smith. I'm the founder of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinics and uh, editor of the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. Thank you. Uh, I've been involved in psychedelic research and treatment for 50 years, so I'm a relic from in the, the past. Uh, my question is to Rick, and I want to... Uh, bias my question so it doesn't sound critical, but I really enjoyed your remarks. And I appreciated uh, your acknowledgement that people have bad trips. Now, I come from the Haight-Ashbury where every drug is legal, you know, everything. Nobody gets arrested, maybe for smoking a cigarette in a uh, restaurant. But <laughs> you can take anything you want, anytime you want, and we have bad trips. So it can't be just the law. We developed the top-down approach, which you indicated you used. Um, your forerunner, Timothy Leary, in 1967 at a similar LSD conference like this, extolling the virtues of LSD, which I read his book and took LSD and thought it was great, we invited him down to see the Bad Trip Center. He didn't want to come because he said, if we talk about bad trips, then somehow or another, it will bias this therapeutic agenda. So I compliment you on acknowledging the dark side, which many of the therapeutic advocates you know, won't do. That denies reality and decreases credibility. My objection, well, it's not an objection, my comment is that you said you were ashamed of that past. Uh, we were outlaws, great things happened, I can understand it. I, for a long time, didn't talk about my LSD experiences. I shared with you, I wouldn't have started the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic if I hadn't taken LSD, and it's treated millions of people free of charge. But at a conference, there was a DEA agent and an FBI agent in the audience. They recorded it and used it to deny one of our grants. That was in the 80s, just say no. But I don't see any DEA agents here. I don't see any FBI agents. This isn't a government-funded uh, program. So I question, do you really believe what you said, or was it a drive for respectability? And what is the agenda for being respectable? Uh, I'm, I'm 74. I'd like to know that. I, I just didn't under... I, I went away thinking, well, he doesn't really believe that. He must have another reason for saying that. So, Well, that's a, a, also a very challenging and good question. But <laughs> it's not that I felt that I was ashamed of identifying as a counterculture criminal. Um, I was more thinking that that's self-defeating. That I think if we, uh, and this idea, there's a, a lot of people like Tim was a good example. Um, at one point, we had a, a conference in um, 1990. Um, at, uh, in Oakland and uh, Tim was one of the speakers and I said can you give us advice on how to work uh, with the government we're starting to try to get permission can you give us advice and Tim was like fuck the government <laughs> you know I don't, I'm beyond that I'm way past that I'm glad that you're trying to do that but fuck the government so I think that there's a self-defeating aspect 
to identifying as being in opposition to the main culture. And so some of the things like we're doing, trying to reach out to the Pentagon or reach out even to the FDA, that those are strategies that we might not have adopted if we're thinking that the system is fundamentally opposed. I mean, I think there's a lot of people I hear that talk about the psychedelic experience as so corrosive of structure that it will inherently be always in opposition to the power structure and that people will be so free thinking that there will never be an opportunity really for society to integrate psychedelics. It just can't happen. I think that denies history. But I, I don't think, uh, and I didn't mean to give the impression that I was ashamed of that, but it was more that there's a self-defeating aspect to it. Yeah, so it was the strategic aspect of the self-identification that bothered you rather than you were ashamed of the past. Right, right. And also, I don't really want to be a criminal. Right. So do, I, neither do I. I'm, <laughs> I'm a grandfather. I don't want to be a criminal. I, so I, in other words, tactically, it does not advance our agenda to identify that way, but you know, the past is our reality. Yes, and I think the values, if we talk about the values of the counterculture, I mean, they've been more and more adopted. I mean, we see it in the environmental movement and the, I think in the gay rights movement and the civil rights movement in so many different ways. I think the problem with Tim also in, in a sense that um, I, I did long-term follow-ups to Tim's two experiments, the Good Friday experiment and the Concord Prison experiment. And what I found was that in the Concord, well, in the first one was the Good Friday experiment, the spiritual use of psilocybin in church on Good Friday with uh, Reverend uh, Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King's mentor at uh, Boston University, that in the report about that study, there was one person that had a difficult experience and ran out of the chapel and had to be brought back in for his own safety. And then uh, he was given by Tim a shot of Thorazine. And that was not ever reported. Right. So I think what Tim did is he overestimate or overpresented the benefit. He exaggerated the benefits and minimized the risks. Right. And in the Concord Prison Experiment, which I did the follow-up to because I thought it was one of the preeminent uh, pieces of scientific literature showing the benefits of psychedelics, that it reduced recidivism. And they gave psilocybin to people in the Concord Prison shortly before they were paroled. And Tim talked about it as being a tremendous success. And it was just a kind of a growing, horrible experience as I realized as I was, uh, it took me a year, I got permission from the governor, I could look at these people's records, and I discovered that Tim had committed scientific fraud and right. that it wasn't a success. Right. And that he actually realized that early on is that it's not just the psychedelic experience. You need the support, you need the integration. The same is true for addiction treatment. You can't just give somebody an Ibogaine experience and all of a sudden they're no longer addicted to opiates and now they're going to be fine. So I think it's the, uh, the misuse of science, and I think there's an equivalency that maybe in his mind was, if they're exaggerating the risks, then I can exaggerate the benefits. And so th that's what I object to. Yeah. And you know, in the sense that we're collectively part of that culture, I think that that, was, that is something to be ashamed about. That was a choice that was not wise. But it's more tactically, if, you, if you're always identifying yourself as opposition, and, and I think people do have to think about, can psychedelics really be integrated? Do they uh, so dissolve our views about power structures that we're always going to be uh, opposed? So I'm, I'm sorry if I gave that opinion that well, I was ashamed of that. Thank you for that clarification and your leadership. I, I think quite an interesting thing is that the international drug control system is simply not interested in psycho, psychedelics. It doesn't come onto their um, rating. They're interested in opiates, cocaine, methamphetamine. And I mean, I go quite a lot to the UN and things. They just don't even know what a psychedelic is and don't want to know. It doesn't come onto their range of experience because there's no crime associated with it. And they're only interested where the crime comes in. So um, th there's kind of no interest in either in the possibility of decriminalizing it, because it's not really a subject, which is quite depressing. Other comments? Another question, please? 
Yes, my name is David Della Paz. I'm a combat veteran, and I bring people back from combat that have PTSD, operate under a small foundation. And my uh, question is on research and development. Dr. Nichols explained last time in his closing statement, almost his last sentence of the last uh, uh, convention, was that uh, there had been a new movement in allowing us to do research and development. Nobody's stopping us and he was going to head back and continue and move forward. I was wondering what the state of R&D is now, what our restrictions were, maybe give us an idea of what is going on now and what we're looking forward to less restrictive R&D in the future. Who's an answer for that? Well, I'll just start by saying that um, from the FDA's point of view, the work um, with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder is something that they are fully supportive of. Um, the issue that we've been addressing ourselves is whether it's um, something that we should be cautious about in terms of enrolling people that have had prior suicide attempts and what happens if we enroll somebody who had previously attempted suicide and then after our treatment they decide to go through with it and succeed, you know, what will that do to our research? And on the other hand, there, we, we don't want to exclude people necessarily because they've been that desperate. They need the help the most. So we, we've thought about possibly having a separate study just for people, for veterans who have, and others who have already attempted suicide at least once. So that in a way we would be segregating the risks so that if we work with people that have not attempted suicide and that goes well then if something bad happens. So what we've decided to do is, at least for now, that we do not exclude people from our studies if they have had prior suicide attempts. And we have had one subject already that we've enrolled who has had a prior suicide attempt. Um, as far as what the view is of the, um, the military, the Department of Defense and the VA towards this area, um, I think that it's still an ongoing discussion as far as whether they will formally be involved. The work that we're doing with veterans right now is with veterans who've come to us from outside the VA system. We've tried for the last 15 years with multiple different VA centers to do work in, in direct collaboration. And the psychiatrists and therapists that work directly with the patients are naturally the most compassionate. And we've had a, a series of aborted projects by people at the higher levels. And so I think that that uh, may be changing. That's what our discussions are about, to try to see if the military might be open to that. And one of the things that, they, uh, that was expressed to us as the biggest concern is that if the military gets directly involved with work with MDMA PTSD, that would send the message in their mind to a lot of the veterans and a lot of the current active duty soldiers that it's okay. And they were worried then that there's only limited number of spots in the therapy studies. And so people would then be trying to treat themselves and they would end up getting impure ecstasy or they would do it in, without proper support and they might end up worse off. Um, I've heard from several people who have treated themselves with MDMA for PTSD and ended up better off. So again, and what was said to us was that that concern should not block the research, that that's their legitimate concern. So I, I think it may be another couple years. I think that the, uh, the study that we're doing in veterans, we're halfway through. It's 24 veterans and firefighters and maybe a police officer. And I've always thought in my mind that we're going to have to finish that study, show positive benefits, and that will be the political cover that the military would need to get involved. And so now, in a way, we're several years ahead of that. We've got promising results from the first half of the people and whether we'll be able to actually get permission to initiate something in cooperation, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know how that'll turn out. But I think the general sense is that there is a, um, a problem that the current right. therapies do not sufficiently address. And, and I should say that after our Psychedelic Science 2010 conference, I was called by a brigadier general inside the Pentagon, called me, uh, General Lori Sutton, and she was in charge of the Defense Centers for Excellence for um, uh, Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury. And that's the part of the Pentagon that actually has hundreds of millions of dollars for PTSD research. 
and she contacted me because she'd heard about our research and she was exploring herself. Uh, shortly after that, she retired. Uh, but were you, but she was willing to speak out to the New York Times article when our long-term follow-up study came out in November. So we do have some high-level people who are willing to go on the record as saying that this research should move forward. So in the longer run, hopefully it's not the long arc of decades and generations, I, I do feel that there's, there's a, a great interest in the military in being compassionate about the soldiers. Yeah, and in that, in that the VA is moving forward, I was wondering if you had a comment on actually the civilian side of this. Is there any restrictions internationally uh, to stop this research? Or are we going to run into well, a problem? Um, That's all it is. Right now, uh, are sitting down. Um, there, there's like, um, like for example, in, in Canada, I mean, it took us four years to get the MDMA once we had the protocols approved. So, but if we just keep at it, there's not legitimate reasons for them to say no. And if we just say, we're just going to keep at it till you say yes, then eventually we get there. So we've been able, one of the reasons that we have an international strategy is that, you know, it's harder to do work outside of the United States. There's language issues, cultural issues, you know, how do we get our clinical team there to monitor the studies? There's a lot of complications, but part of the basis for this international strategy was what if there's a backlash in the U.S.? What if somehow or other this uh, freedom that we have is uh, blocked and it's like medical marijuana research, we can't do it. But if we have multiple countries where we're doing research, we can withstand backlash in any one country. Plus, regulators don't like to be the only one that said yes to something. You know, if there's others that say yes, then there's uh, comfort and safety in numbers. So I, I can't say that we're past the time where there's a, a potential for backlash, but it feels like we're, we're pretty strongly past that, pretty likely. And so we've now been able to get permission all over the world. Um, I think in certain countries, you know, every time it's the first time in that country to open the door to psychedelics, it will be problematic and it will take a long time. Um, and then with the study that we started in 2000 in Spain with Jose Carlos Buso, um, we were shut down in 2002, but that was sort of at the height of the hysteria of MDMA neurotoxicity, one dose permanent brain damage. And also we didn't have the understanding enough of the local culture and the local power structure to overcome that. So I, I think that now we probably could get permission again in Spain because of all this other uh, data that's been generated. And so now we finally have evidence on the benefit side of the equation. It used to be that if there's any risk, that's so much because there's no benefits. So even mild risk means you can't go forward. Now that we have the evidence about benefits, now it's a risk-benefit calculation. So I think we're really in, in good shape uh, as far as doing this research. Whether the military will participate, what, what we can say for sure is that they are watching, they are hoping for the best, and they are evaluating whether they can get directly involved. Other comments? I think we have time for one more question. Oh, hi. Uh, my, name, my name is Jerry Brown, which is why I don't live in California. Um, I'm an anthropologist by training. I've taught a course on hallucinogens and culture at Florida International University in Miami uh, since 1974. And the question I wanted to ask to Rick or anyone else who would like to comment on it is really about uh, First Amendment religious freedom uh, issue. Uh, obviously, the branding of the Native American church as a church was a very successful strategy. In 1993, uh, Ernesto Pichardo, a Santeria from Miami, won a 9 to 0 a Supreme Court decision in his favor to have a church of Lukumi in Hialeah, uh, overturning laws that had been passed to ban the animal sacrifice around that. Uh, and, and Scalia wrote the majority opinion on that. So I, I'm ignorant of, but I'm, I'm curious about what the thinking has been about pursuing a, and obviously the, so much research on religion and, and theogens as being a pathway to an authentic religious experience has been done. What is the thinking, because I'm sure people in your seats have considered this, about a First Amendment approach and, and why has that been taken or what, what are the issues involved there? That's my question, essentially. I'll, just say, I'll say one thing and then I think Bobby has a lot more to share. 
which is that Jeffrey Bronfman, we're very fortunate to have Jeffrey Bronfman here, and he's going to be talking, I think, sometime tomorrow or Sunday, I'm sure. Um, but he's the one that was able to get the Supreme Court to unanimously support the religious freedom for the UDV to use ayahuasca. So he has the real understanding of what the issues are. But again, it requires a religion where the use of the psychedelics are central to that religion, and it has to be a group. And whether that can expand to somehow amorphous spirituality with, you know, um, I'm, I'm not so sure that that can be done. Uh, number one, I'm not a lawyer. But I have thought about this for quite a long time. Jeffrey Bronfman's case was won under the authority of something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act does not require that religious freedom be restricted to groups in contrast to individuals. It does not require, first of all, it's not specific to the Controlled Substances Act, although there is a history of several years, order of three to five, that had its origins in a Native American peyote case that went to the Supreme Court, resulted in a redefinition of religious liberty, Congress uh, responded to the Supreme Court by restoring religious, uh, religious liberty with an act. So there's substances in there. But religious liberty applies, for example, to the wearing of religious clothing in prisons and many, many other cases. So under RFRA, RFRA, as it's called, there's not an encoded requirement for groups. There's not an encoded requirement that the activity, such as the wearing of the religious garb, be central to the religion. It simply says... The courts are required on a case-by-case -case basis to evaluate, is there a compelling governmental interest in upholding the law to which an exemption is being requested? That's question one. And the second, is total prohibition the, quote, least restrictive means of satisfying that governmental concern? So that's all it says. Mr. Prison Warden, is it absolutely necessary to prevent the prisoner from wearing that kind of hat? Oh, it isn't. Well, what's, what's the least restrictive means of keeping the prison safe if the person's going to wear that hat? That's the dialogue. It's a very difficult dialogue to have in the arena of, I'm going to use the D word, drugs, because drugs are widely misunderstood. We don't have a good categorization system for them legally, and it um, evokes a lot of irrational thinking. So I don't see a systemic reason why this couldn't be resolved. Uh, let's go to the question of uh, opposition uh, that came up a little while ago. Who here knows the martial art Aikido? Heard of it even? Mm -hmm. not, not too many people. One of the principal teachings in Aikido is that when a force is coming at you, a natural instinct is to come right back at it or to stop it, to stop it frontally or, or to fight fire with fire. And a principal teaching in Aikido is that if something's coming at you, I kind of want to get up and show you. If something's coming at you like this, instead of doing this, you meet it and you blend with it and you go with it for a little while until you can use whatever mechanical advantage you have to take it more in the direction you want to go. Um, sorry if that's a little metaphorical. Here's why I bring it up. If you can suspend for a moment a deep conviction about personal liberty, which I think most of us have, but try setting that aside. Try imagining that it's not our, the libertarian thing is not our number one guiding principle. Try to do that. It's hard. Now go back to this conversation. Somebody's first plunge into non-duality, you know, imagine you came up in a culture like ours, commercialized like ours, governed like ours, violent like ours, very, very dualistic. And not really knowing what you're getting into, you take a heroic dose of something and you are plunged into non-duality. And you don't have any friends or elders or parents or family or mentors who have taken that plunge before. That can be a very destabilizing thing and has been destabilizing. I met somebody at lunch for whom that was very destabilizing as a young adult. It's fine now, by the way, but you know, it took some years to find your sea legs after that. In an ideal culture, would you want somebody taking that plunge without a community around them? I see one person shaking their head, no, you'd like community around that. So you can see that there's some wisdom even in wanting these kinds of experiences to have some kind of group support. Now I'm not saying that because I think people should go to prison when they don't have it. I'm just saying 
that if we're looking for the force that's coming at us called government, there's a way to blend with it in saying, you know, there's actually wisdom in having these experiences ensconced in a supportive context. That's the dialogue that's going to meet RIFRA and will eventually allow other groups to enjoy the freedom that Jeffrey Bronfman's group has now. Sorry if that was a little obtuse. We could talk more later. That was quite beautiful. And all the panelists, please help me thank the panelists. Thank you so much.